maybe three, four major concepts that I want to cover in regards to React. Uh, so the first one is basically how to use forms in React. Second is how the child components can talk to the parent component. We've seen how the parent can talk to the child by sending properties. Uh, so we will see how the child can talk with the parent using callbacks. Um, then we will see some what is known as hooks. Um, I will explain what they are. And finally, fourth, fourth thing is a router. So you, this might not make too much sense for you. I'm just putting this uh, plan. And then by the end of this session, hopefully all of these will be very clear. And in the lab, of course, you will practice this. So let us get started. So by now, you already know how to create basic components. You know how a component can receive parameters from the parent. You know how a component can manage state. So hopefully by now, you, you're already familiar with this. Of course, uh, for you to really uh, grasp the concept more, you have to practice. And that's what you will be doing in the lab and, of course, uh, exploring the examples I have provided. So let me go straight into... Uh, into forms. And I will uh, explain this through an example. I think it's much easier to explain this through an example. Uh, so let me first try to run it. Hopefully it runs. Okay. So what I want to explain is just this form, how this form can be done and can be handled using React. So this form here is a sign-up form it is a component by itself. So I just want to explore how this is built and how we can manage this form using React. So this little form here, which is a sign-up form, is implemented by this component called sign-up. So here is the, the UI of this form. So what this form uh, returns it returns a form. This is plain HTML. You're already familiar with it. There's nothing uh, special here. Uh, so each input, I have a label for it, and I have an input uh, element where the user can type in, let's say, the first name, and then last name, and another one for email, another one for password, and I have a submit button. So this part, you are already familiar with how to create a form using HTML. Now, the next is how I can link this form to and make it a React uh, sorry a React component. How can I make this form a React component? So to make this form a React component, typically what I would do for each of the ele for each of the inputs in the form, I will have a state variable. Remember state variables that we have in components. State variables are used to store some data that the components will manage. So in this case, we have a five, uh, you see here, we have five inputs, uh, one for first name, last name, email, and password, uh, four inputs. So I have four inputs, and I will have four, four state variables. For each input, I have a state variable. And if you recall, we always create state variables using use state. And this will give me, when I use this use state, it will give me a variable and the associated function to update it when this variable changes. Okay, so, so what I really have, uh, let me try to draw it here, just for you to get the idea clearer. So what I have, I have input fields or input elements. Uh, in HTML, and for each element, I create an associated state variable. So for each element, I have a state variable, and what I need to do, I need to link this to. I need to link the element with its associated state variable. Yeah. So how I do this? How do I do the linking? So it's very easy. All I do. You see in here, when the component is created, 
whatever the value happens to be in the state variable, I show it in the input. So how do I show the state vari variable in the input? By assigning the state variable to the value property. And I do this for every element. For every, uh, for every uh, input element, I show the associated state variable. I assign it to the value. Why I am doing this? So the value that is stored in this state variable will be shown in the input. Now, when the user types something in the input field, what do I want to do when the user types something? I should write it back to the, to the state variable. So basically, the state variable and the input need to always be synchronized. So to do this, again, it's easy to do. All I do is whenever the input changes, I call this set first name and I give it E dot, uh, the e.target.value. E You're already familiar with this e.target.value. This gives you the current value of the input. That's it. That's all I'm doing. So in forms, to summarize, in the React forms, I create a form the normal way. And then for each element on the form, for each input element in the form, I create an associated uh, um, state variable. And then what should I do? I should always try, uh, keep these two synchronized. How do I keep them synchronized? By two steps. Here, here are the two steps. First, I assign the state variable to the value. So whatever the value happens to be in the state variable when the form loads will be written in the input. And then whenever the user changes the input, it gets stored in the state variable. Yeah? So let, let me show you this more concretely. So if I come here uh, to this um, example, I will just do a couple of changes here. So after the button, I will just put here, uh, let's say, a paragraph. And in this paragraph, I will output all the state variables, just for you to see them as we, do, as we, go, as we go. So here are the state variables. I have first name. Um, let me put each one in its own paragraph. And I have the second state variable is last name. Now let me put it here to be clear. This is enough. Okay. So initially, initially you see those are Empty. There is nothing in them because the initial value is empty. Because when I created these uh, state variables, I put, I initialized them with an empty string. But as soon as I start typing here, let's say, can you see down there? The, the first name state variable is being changed as I change the input. And here. Something like this. So now when I submit the form, all the data that I have entered, where is it already stored? In the state variables. I don't need to go back to the input fields and go to the DOM and try to read these values. They are already in the state variables, and then I can do whatever I wish with them. I could push them to use a, call a web API and push them to the server, store them in some uh, database or send them to another component or do whatever I want to do with them. So that's the basic idea. The basic idea, I have a form that gives a visual interface for the user to enter the data. And behind the form, I have state variables. And what I do with this form element and state variables, mm -hmm. I link them. Whenever the user changes or enters data in the input, in the input elements, whatever they enter, it gets immediately pushed or stored into this in the state variables. And the reason why I'm doing this, once the user is ready to submit, all the data is already in variables and I can just quickly make use of it. Yeah? Uh, so for example, in here, uh, let me just fill up this form. 
In here, for example, all I'm doing, I'm just displaying. In real life, of course, you, will, you might call some web API to store this information on the server. In here, I'm just displaying the values that the user entered in a JSON object. I'll show you shortly what, how this is done. So, so basically when the form is submitted, here is the submit button. When the form is submitted, there is an event that, that will be raised. This event is called on submit. There is, the form has an on submit event. And when this on submit event happens, what I will do? I will call this sub, handle submit. Uh, don't worry about this validation. All this handle submit is doing is creating an object. It's creating an object based on the state variables. And here I'm just displaying it as a JSON object. Remember when I create state variables, how do I create state variables in a component? Using this built-in method called useState. And this useState returns two, two things. It returns the variable, and a function to change it. Now in here you can, you can call this whatever you wish, but usually we call the function to change the state variable, we call it set, and whatever name you want to, you want to call it. So these names, it is your choice. Which, whichever, uh, whichever state variable name makes sense, you can go ahead and, and do, do so. Is clear? So I hope it is clear. So. Um, but there is a little bit of inconvenience here. You can see here for each input in the form, I go ahead and create a state variable. That's one way of doing it. One way of doing it. Another way of doing it, um, it's your choice, is I can, instead of putting, uh, instead of putting the state, sorry, instead of, uh, instead of creating a variable, for each input in the form, I create an object that will have all the elements in the form. So let me show you this one. This is the login form. And the login, you can see, this is another form. It has only two attributes, uh, email and password. So, of course, I can go ahead here and create, uh, I can go ahead and create two state variables one for email, and I call it set email. And by default, it will be an empty string. And I can here create another state variable password. I will call it here set password. Ah, already set. And the initial value will be an empty string. I can do this and I keep creating the state variable for each input. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is I can create an object that has all my state variables, in one, all of them in one object. So, and in, in this case, I can call it values and set values. You can call this whatever you wish. And then what I'll do, you can see here the value will be, uh, values dot not user let me call it email and make sure in here yes it's called email so basically instead of having individual uh, individual state variables i have properties of one state variable object that's all that's all i'm doing here and then whenever it change whenever the state variable change all i do i call this handle change this handle change, it, looked it looks a little bit scary, but it's very, very powerful. Uh, so what it's doing, you know, what is e.target? What is this e.target? This, uh, this is the event that was raised, and the target is the element that raised the event. Yeah? So this could be, let's say, the email, the email input, or it could be the password input. So what I'm doing here, I hope you know you by now you should be familiar with this syntax. What I'm doing in this line? What's the what's the what's the JavaScript feature I'm using here? The object destructory. Very good. So what I what is it, what it really means? I'm extracting the name and putting it in the name variable, 
and I'm extracting the value and putting it in in the value variable. Yeah, that's what it's doing. <laughs> then, this, in the set values, in the set values, what I do, I am I clone the object. So what I'm doing here, when you see this dot dot values, what I'm doing, I'm creating a clone, a copy of the values, and then changing the property that has changed. Either the email has changed, I, I changed the value of the email, or the password has changed, I changed the value of the password. Now, this looks a little bit cryptic, but this can handle any input. So what I want to say, let me, let me just... Uh, Okay, very good. Uh, remember, when uh, when we're talking about state variables, when we're talking about state variables, we should not change them directly. Remember this discussion we had last time. State variables in React. Okay, so let me go back and explain this super important concept. Um, So when I declare state variables, I create them using uh, use state. Now, if I want to change a state variable, what should I do? Use the set state variable. I need to use the set state. Uh, sorry, I need to use the set method that is returned by the use state to change the state variable. So what I mean by this, I should not just come to this. Um, Let's, let's say values dot email equal one equal let's say the value that I received as an example I should never do this I should not change the state variable directly instead I should create a new object and kind of replace the old one so how do I create a new object based on the previous one so I clone it I clone the previous object and then change whatever I need to change. Let, let me show you what, what I mean by this. Um, so if I go here, let's say I have here let, uh, uh, let's say student equals just an object here, first name. is. Uh, Um, last name something like this okay so I have here an object called student here is my student's object so if I want to create a clone of this object so clone if I do here for example let's say if I do here let student 2 equals student. Is this a, is, is a student to a copy of student? Or is it just a reference to a student? If I do it this way. You see here, student two, here is the student two. It has exactly the same values. Now, if I go to student and change the name, the first name, change the first name to Okay. Now, if I go to student two, what do you think the value of, of the first name? Are you sure? It's the new one. Because student two is nothing but a reference to student one. Sorry? It's not a clone. There is a difference between a clone and a reference. So... Let me do it one more time. If I do here set, uh, let's say, let student student 3 equals student. So student 3 is what? A reference to student to students. If I change student, what, hap what will happen to student 3? It will change because it is just a ref referring to the same object. Yeah? So basically what I'm doing here you see what it means. Um, all I'm doing, 
this is students student this is the first name this is the last name so when I'm creating student 2 by assigning student to student 2 student 2 is just a pointer to student to students and even if I do it for student 3 if I say student 3 equals student, student 3 is nothing but a pointer a refer a referring to the, to the original object. Of course, if I change anything in student, these two are just looking at the same memory location. So how do I create a clone, which is basically a copy? That is... Yes. So what I do here, take a look at this. So what I... How to create a clone... Many ways of doing it, but one elegant way of doing it. This is a so all I do, I open this curly brace and then distract the original object. This is student. This will create a clone, not a reference. Yeah, this is student. Now, if I go back to student now and change the first name, let's say to Sar, okay, what will happen to student clone? It won't, it won't change because it's a different object. It's a yeah, it's a copy. It's an independent copy. Yeah? So that's exactly what I'm doing. I first clone the object and then change, <coughs> change some values on the object. So what I'm doing, let, take a look at this. I will uh, change the clone here, take a look. In here, I clone the object, then, then I add or modify some existing properties on, on the object. For example, I might change here, last name, last name might be, uh, Ali, for example, and age, I can add extra properties, something like this, yeah? So you can see here, the, the Tamim surname was replaced by Ali, and there is an extra property, which is age. So this is how we, what I'm doing in this mind is very, it looks a little bit scary, but first I'm cloning the original object, and then modifying the last name and adding extra property. This is exactly what's going on here. Uh, you need to really understand this because this is exactly what's going on here. Because in React, I'm not supposed to change the original state variable. I'm supposed to create a new state variable and then set it, uh, set it on the uh, using the set method or the set function associated with that state variable. Is this clear? So. Uh, everyone is understanding what's going on here. I create a clone of this object, and then I go ahead and change the property that has that has changed. So, in case in case this uh, the uh, the handle uh, in case the handle the handle change is called by by this input, what will change? The email will change. In case the the password changes, and this handle change will change the password. So to, to make it clearer, let me just show you uh, what's going on here. So if I, if I make here a paragraph, and in here I put uh, values.email, and I put another paragraph, values.password, yeah? So if I go back, uh, both of them are empty now. Let me add some, this is the email, so we see them clearly. This is the email and this is the password. I go back here, currently they are empty. Take a look at this. As soon as I start typing, the email variable gets changed. Yeah? 
as soon as I start typing. Who is doing this change? Is this function I just showed you. It's very generic. It can work with any input. Uh, to make it clearer, let me let me show you here what's going on. Let me show you. I do here console.log. And I will log these two variables, the name and the value. Okay. So if I go back, I'll clear this. So as I type here, take a look. So the, the, the input that is being changed is the email input, and the new value is E, E-R. And as I start typing, it happens. Yeah, you see here, the email has changed. So what happened is, what's happening here, whenever I change any, any input so as I type, uh, my app will take the original object, clone it, and then change the email to this new email. And then if I, uh, same thing will happen for the password. Take a look. When I start typing the password, yeah, so what's happening every time I type, the original object gets cloned and the password gets changed. By the time I am ready to submit, where is all my data that I have entered already? It's already in the values object. It's already in the values object. So once I click here, I already have my value object, which is the email and the password. Are you following? So basically, to summarize, it's very super simple. When you create uh, when you create a form, so when you create a form in a React, what you do, you create the form the normal way. You know how to create forms using inputs and select uh, inputs, whatever inputs you want to use. And then you have two choices. You can keep it simple, and for each input, you create a state variable. Whenever the, and then you, you link the state variable with the corresponding input, input element. And the reason you do that is that as the user enters the data, the data gets automatically stored into the state variables. By the time you click submit, you have all the data already captured in variables, ready for you to make whatever, whatever you want to do with them. Um, so you can either create individual variables for each input, or you can put all the state variables in one object and you create one state variable to handle all of them. But in this case, uh, whenever, you, whenever something change, you clone the original object and you change the state variable that has, that has changed. And you do this, the good news is you do this with this very generic two lines these two lines function. It can do it for you to keep the uh, to keep the state object and the form synchronized. This very simple function. Of course, you need to understand it. I think I hope it is clear by now. It, initially, it looks a little bit scary, and I think it's very very powerful and very concise. I hope it's clear. Is is the clear, forms how to handle forms? Clear now? And of course, once the form is submitted, you have this on submit. And on submit, you can call uh, this function. Hopefully, this is. Let me just try it with this one. Hopefully, it still works. Which is good. Still working. So, and here, what, all I'm doing, I'm taking these values, which represent what the user have entered, and I am showing it in JSON. You can do whatever. You can do a web, web API call and submit it to the server or do whatever you wish. Yeah, here, your imagination is the limit. You have full JavaScript to do whatever you want to do. Okay. So I hope this first uh, goal is achieved. Um, to some extent, you have to, as I mentioned, uh, you have to really practice this to grasp the concept more. So that's it. This is done. The second goal we want to do is the child wants to communicate something to the parent. For parent to child, we already know how to do this. You remember, yes? Just to, just to remind you. Sorry? Using attributes. Using, like, yes, yeah, so the parent, when it creates a child, it can pass attributes in the, in the tag. 
and the child will receive them as props. And props they can access wherever the parents has passed. So just to remind you how it looks, here it is. Here is an example. So what I have here, these are uh, maybe not this one. Let me give you a, a short, uh, simpler example. Here it is. So here I have this. I am uh, the parent. The parent component, which is app component, is making use of the welcome component. And when I'm doing this welcome component, I am when I'm making use of this welcome component, I am passing this parameter here by setting the attribute app name. And here there is the React demo app. So he, this is a parameter I am passing to the welcome. If I go to welcome, these the parameters that were passed are accessible in this props um, uh, props parameter, and then I can make use of it to read whatever the user have sent me. Yeah, a better way of doing it. Remember, better way of doing it. Last time we did it, we can do object destructuring again here, and I can directly make use of this something like this. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I, what we want to achieve now is what if the, the child wants to pass something to the parent? How we will do it? Yeah. So the communication between the child and the parent follows uh, well-defined channels. So from parent to child, we know how to to do this by passing props. And for, from child to parent, how the communication take place? Using callbacks. Let me explain this uh, and give you an example to really illustrate what I mean. Okay. Let me just come here to this form. And I just want to create something you are already familiar with. An A tag. It's an A tag. It has an href taking us nowhere. And in this, in this tag, I will say here, click me. And in here, what I will be doing, on click, when this, when this uh, button is clicked, I will say, I will run this function here. I will say alert, and I will say, you did it. Is clear what's going on here? Um, so let me show you this, how it will look like. See, this is the button, click me. When I click it, it says you did it. So what's happening here, uh, let me make it a little bit clearer by going back here. And I will just create a function here, handle click. And I will make it this way. So this is a function, handle click. Whenever this button is clicked, I will call this function called handle click. Um, so it's just making it a little bit more organized. Here it is. So if I click this, it says you did it. Now, you can see here, when I have a, an element in JavaScript, uh, sorry, an, an HTML element, what I can do what I'm doing now, I am passing this function, this callback function to this element. I'm saying to this element, whenever this element is clicked, what the element should do? It should call this handle click. Yeah. So you can think of it as, in this case, this child, A, the anchor tag, is calling back the parent method, which is handle click, Method whenever this event happens. Okay, so basically the 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 parent is telling the child what to do when certain events happen, and the 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 child basically is uh, will be informing the parent whenever the event will happen, and when the event happen, the the callback function will be automatic will be called when the event happens. So this is built in in Java in uh, in HTML built in, in on the web browser. So we want to do something similar. We want to do something similar for 
our component that we create ourselves. So let me show you what, what I mean by this. Let me first comment this because we don't need it anymore. I just wanted to explain in general how event handling happens in, uh, in, on, on the web browser. You're already familiar with this, but I just wanted to highlight it. So this is the example I want to provide to work on now. So we have a list of friends here, and I can add friend. Um, whatever. Um, already there. Yeah. So this this the, this list is one component, and the uh, and this form that you see there is a child component. So let me show you what I mean. You see the list that you see, the list of friends that you see is generated by this little piece of code here. So I have this friend uh, state, state variable friends initialized with these values. And all I am doing here, I'm creating an unordered list and looping through, looping through each friend and displaying it in a, in a, in a list item. We've seen this. This should be familiar to you. Then the form, the form that we see up there that has a text box and an add button, it is provided by this child component. This is a child component called friend form. Now, here is the friend form. Let's take a look at it. Here is the friend form. So the friend, uh, it simply has an input box and has a button. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating a state variable and linking it with, with the input. You already know how to do this. We just, we just discussed it. We have an input, input here. Because I want, I, in React, I don't go and access the DOM element directly. I don't go and access the input elements directly. I don't read and write to them directly. How do I read and write to input elements in React? By associating them with state variables. Yes? This is exactly what I do. Now, when the submit button, when this add button, uh, when this add friend button is clicked. How do I handle this? So on click, I will call this handle add friend. And what this handle add friend is doing? Add friend to the list. Thank you very much. This is, this is supposed to be doing adding the friend to the list. But do these components have the list of friends? It doesn't have the list of friends. Who owns the list of friends? Who owns it? The parent component, which is the friends list component. So what I mean is, what we have, maybe uh, it's a bit confusing for you. Here it is. New. Um, yeah. So what we have, we have a component called friends list. Yeah, and this friends list, what does it have as a state? It has a state variable, friends. And what this friends, uh, this state variable, of course, has a list of friends. And what this component is doing is displaying this list of friends in a, an unordered list. It's also this, uh, this friends list also has a child component child component what is the name of this child component child form in this in the, in our scenario we call it a friend form friend form so the friend form has an input and it has an add button yes now when i click when i type in a new friend and click the add what's supposed to be happening the new friend i entered should be added to the list of friends but the friends, does it belong to this child component? When is the friends list? In the parent. Can the child component access the parent component state? No. Not allowed. The state is something private. Nobody is able to access it except the owner of the state. So what is the solution? How can the child 
add the new friend to the list. It has to ask the parent to do it. Okay? So yes, that's what's going on. So the parent, sorry, the child, which is in our case, what is the child component in this scenario? The friend form. The friend form, whenever a new friend is added, it should notify, it should notify the parent component. In this scenario, what is the parent component? Friends list. And say, here you are, I have a new friend, and this is the name of the friend. And what the, what the parent is supposed to do? Supposed to add it to the list. You, you get the idea. Yeah? So how do we do this? So you can see here in the friends form, whenever I click this button, I go ahead and say handle form. And basically what I'm doing, I call back, I call back the function that the, that the, uh, the parent gave to the child. Yeah? I call back the function that the parent gave to the child. Uh, so here it, here it is. Take a look at this. You know, uh, here's my child component. When the parent created the child component, what did it pass to it as a parameter? This event handler. It said to the parameter, whenever there is a new friend added, what should the, what should the child do? It should call, call back call back the parent. So the parent should hand over to the child the callback function. And when the event happened, the child should use that function to call back the, the parent. Yes? So, but mechanically, the way we do it, in this case, take a look at this. In this case, uh, the add, uh, the handle uh, friend, let's say, uh, handle friend, what's, what we do in here, this is a list. Remember that friends is a list or an array in this case, it is an array. So the way we will add the friend, we will call this set friend. And then how do we do it? We first clone the previous friends and add the new one. Similar to the way we do it for objects, but here we are doing it for an array. We clone the previous ones and we add the new one. And that's it, once we set this new list, we, we get the new friends and set them in, set them using, uh, or store them in the friends using the set friends. React will wake up and say, oh, the friends list has changed. So what the React should do once the friends list has changed? It should re-render this. It should re-render this. What I mean here, take a look at this. Whenever I add a new friend, It gets rerun. This part gets re-rendered. I didn't write any code to re to change the DOM or create this new list item. It was automatically done. What as a programmer, what did I do to influence this list or to re-render this list? Or to re-render this unordered list? All I did was change the states variable. All I did here, I changed the states variable friends using the set friends and react knew what to do. It, it detected that there is a change. The friends, the old friend list and the new friends list is different. So it computes the difference and re-renders the, the list of friends. Okay, so let me try to summarize this. So here is the big picture. How do, how do parents talk to, ch to children? How do they pass them data to the children by using props. And how do ch children communicate back with, with the parents? Through callbacks, okay? Um, so let me show you here. I think this is exactly what I tried to show you here. So to summarize, so the parent component in, a, in our case is friends list is the parent component and the child component is the friends form. And what I'm doing here, I'm asking the friends form, say, when there is, whenever a new friend is added, I want you to call me back on this, on, this is the, fun, the, the callback function you should call whenever a new friend is added. And, the, and that's what exactly the, uh, the, friends, compo uh, the friends form is doing. 
So how do we know new friend is added? When the user type in a new friend and they click the button add friend. When they click the button add friend, what should we do? We should call back the parent. Uh, when we call back the parent, of course, we have to give the callback the name of the new friend. So that's how we are communicating, how the child is communicating back to, to, to the parent. It's communicating back to the parent by calling the callback function and providing the input parameter to the callback function. In this case, what is the input parameter to the callback function? The name of the new friend. And in here, what this line is doing? Set name, empty string. You see here, after I add, let me refresh this. After I add new friend, I do add. I call the parent and say, here is a new friend, Ali. Go ahead and add to the list and clear the box. So I can allow me to add a new friend again. That's what that sets. Um, you see here, this is a, yet another example that re, in React, you just change the state value. And let React change the UI. I did not go to this, uh, I did not go to this input and say, uh, input, go to the DOM, get the inputs, uh, go to the value and set the value to empty. Did I do this in here? No, all I did is set the state. And that's why it's called React. React is called React because it's reacting to changes to the state. So as programmers, we just create, create the user interface, create states variables, link the two. Whenever there is a change, we change the states variable and React will auto-render the UI. This is a fundamental idea of React. There are a couple of hooks. I will explain these. They sound a little bit complicated, but they are super easy. Take a look at this. What I have here is a search, is a search box. I, when I search, I get some search results. Take a look at this list. It changed as I type in a new search input. For example, I put here React hooks. See here, new. This is a new feature in React. Or whenever, whenever I change like React state, React state or React props, something like this. So as I type, the result change. Not only this, when the form is first loaded, I already get some results. When the form is first loaded, when the component let me make, make it more clear. When the search component is first loaded, what happened? I already went to the search engine and got some results for this keyword uh, React. So what I want to say here, hooks allow me to listen to some events in the life cycle of the object. Life cycle means the object, not the life cycle of the object, the life cycle of the component. So when the component first time get loaded into the page, I want to do some logic. I want to run some code. Or let's say I want to run some code whenever uh, the uh, whenever this state variable change. I want to watch the state variable and run some code whenever that state variable change. So to, to achieve this, React gives us this special function called use effect. And what this use effect is doing is basically running this function. What this function is, is basically doing, it goes to this uh, URL. It gives it the query that I'm looking for. It could be, let's say, React, React Hooks, whatever it might be, the query. And it does a web API call using fetch. You're already familiar with this uh, code in here. And gets the list of results. And among the results, there will be one, object, one list called hits. Basically, it's coming back from this uh, service. So if I go to this service, just to show you, if I go here, okay, and then I put here React. Oops. So I get back a JSON object, and this JSON object has this object called hits. And hits has a lot of uh, properties. I'm not interested in all of them. What I am interested in, I think the description, what is it called? 
Yes, this one, title. I am only interested in the title. Yeah. So what's happening here? Whenever, whenever the query changes, I want to rerun this. Whenever the query changes, I want to rerun this. So how do I do this? Whenever the query changes, I want to rerun this code. All I do, I pass it to this use effect, use effect uh, hook. This use effect is basically a hook that allows me to tell React whenever this query. Uh, state variable changes, I want you to rerun this code. Yeah? Now, what if I want to say to the React, whenever this first only do this the first time the component loads, the first time the component loads, I want you to run this code. So what I do in this case, I just put an empty string. What, ha what will happen here, um, too many things open. Let me just close them all. Close all tabs. Okay. Okay, so let me, let me just go back. Yep. Let me rerun this. Yep, much better. Okay, you see here, this this code, this list was generated the first time the component was loaded. But if I change this, nothing is happening here. Why is it not happening? Because I told use effect, what did I do here? I told use effect to only run this function, this function here. I told it to run it once and only once when the component loads. I didn't, want, I didn't tell use effect Watch for me this variable whenever this variable changes, rerun this code. Yeah? So now if I want to tell this use effect whenever this query parameter changes or this query state variable changes, rerun this code. How do I tell use effect to do so? By placing it in this second in this array, uh, the second parameter of use effect. So use effect takes two parameters. The first parameter is a function. And the second parameter is an array. Now, if you want to run something only the first time the component load, how do you do this? Yes, set the second variable of use effect to an empty array. Now, what if you want to rerun the code that you gave to use effect every time some state variable change? Put the name of the state variable in that array. And then magically the React will do it for you. Yeah? So use effect is very, very powerful. Why do we use it? Two scenarios we use it for. What are the two major scenarios we use use effect? Now, first one is to initialize some state variables with the component log. You see here, if I, if I empty this, if I keep this empty, what I'm really doing, I'm initializing the news. When this initialization will take place, the first time the component load on the page. Yes? This is the first scenario when we use hooks. What is the, so, sorry, when you use the use effect hook. Um, what is the second scenario where we use use effect? Is to watch some state variable. Whenever that state variable change, what do we do? What we use effect will do? We'll rerun the function, which means in this case we rerun the function and change the and uh, get a new fresh news and set it to the news to the news uh, parameter. Yeah, so this is very powerful um, powerful feature that that is in React. Um, now, what if I don't supply this at all? I don't supply this. Now, in here, what will happen is. This function will 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 uh, be re-executed every time any any state variable change, any state variable change. This will be executed. In, in most cases, this is not what you want. Yeah, in most cases, you are watching particular variables and you're reacting to them. But if you don't supply the second parameter, this function will be re-executed whenever any state variable. If the news change, this will be re-executed. If the query change, this will be re-executed. When the, when the uh, form loads, this will be re-executed. 
Yeah. Uh, so let me show you here. Sometimes you might end up with an infinite loop because, you, yeah. So in here it, it, it still works because uh, because any you see it it runs multiple times. If you look at it carefully, it runs multiple times because the news when I change the when I change the query the news changed and the news change triggered the execution of the function. Are you following? Mm -hmm. So use effect is very very powerful little function. It can do three things in one. It depends how you configure it. You can configure it to only run when the component loads on the page. How do you do this? Empty. Pass an empty array as a second parameter. You can also tell use uh, effect to only execute one when certain variables change. How do you do this? <laughs> yes, mention the name of the variable in the array. Now, third way, which is not recommended, not very common, is to tell use effect to, to re-execute whenever anything change, whenever any, st any state variable change. In this case, you just don't supply the second parameter. In this case, it will be executed every time. But the most common usage, uh, what is the most realistic and common usage? Yes, the common usage is, um, yep, let's me. The common use is, is either you, you are intending to initialize the list once when the form loads, when the component loads, that's one use case, or you are watching a particular, um, you are watching a particular state variable or multiple state variables whenever they change your reload. So I hope it's clear. So the last thing, so hopefully this is a, a tick for this. But of course, you need to practice it. Last thing, last thing I want to really explain now is a router. First, I will show it through an example and then explain what it is. Um, so remember a uh, single page application architecture we discussed last time. What does it mean? Anybody can remind us what is a single page architecture? Spot. Very good. And how many pages we have in the whole of one page? So we have one page, and basically, typically the page will have some kind of main menu, and whenever the user clicks a different menu item, what the app supposed to do? Load the different components, okay? So of course you can do this programmatically, but there is a more elegant way of doing this, declaratively. I, I'll show you what, what this means shortly. So let me open another example. Uh, here is the example, React example. A new one. Okay, let me first run it. So to run the example, so as you remember, like to run the example, I will say parcel. To, this is to, to transpile and bundle all the code that I have written in this, in this uh, solution. And I give it the entry point. The entry point is source slash index dot HTML. So this will go ahead, go to the components, and it will uh, it will go to the components, tra transpile them, and bundle everything in in one JavaScript file. And here is my it will run my app and put it deploy it to a server. So here it is. Take a look at this. I kept it super simple to illustrate the concept. So in here, this is my main page. When the when the when the single page loads, what do I get there? Up? Up there, I'm getting a menu. And every time I click a link, what happened? A new component get, get loaded. New component is loaded every time. Each of those that you see is a component. Yeah? So now, to enable this, like basically what I'm doing here, I am uh, associating a URL with component. Take a look. When I say here slash about, slash about, this is a URL. Slash about is a URL. When I click, the, the about component get loaded. When I do slash uh, home, the home component, uh, not slash home. There is no slash home. That's just you put slash. The home component get loaded. 
if I do slash topics, the topics components get loaded. If I do slash topics slash components, the topic components get loaded and this component here is just a parameter. Remember URLs can have parameters. Mm -hmm. So the last piece of the URL is a parameter. So I can here also load a topic called uh, props versus um, state. So this is a parameter that I am reading from the URL and I am displaying it here. Yep. So now let me show you. I, from end user perspective, it's clear what we're doing here. So every time the URL changes, different components get loaded. And how this is achieved? By using a React router. So a React router is a separate component. It doesn't come from React directly. It comes from a different team that they built this very famous library. So you need to install it first. So you do npm install a React router. So just to give you an idea here, npm uh, React router. Um, so just for last week, see how popular is this one? How many downloads just this week? Two and a half million downloads. Okay, so very, very popular uh, uh, library. So let, let me show you how it works. So once you download it and install it, what you do is you import it into your, into your component. Here is my main component. And what I do, I import these three things. I import browser router, route, and link. And I will explain what each one does. I import them from React Router DOM. So React Router can work with web and can work with mobile, native, React Native. It doesn't matter. Here we're focusing on, on uh, using a React Router for web application. So I import these libraries or these classes from this uh, package. Yes? Now, take a look. What I'm doing here in my, in my root components, I'm returning a router of a router component. I'm returning a router component. And what in this inside this router component, what I have is I have a, a nav bar. I will show you what the nav bar looks like. And then in here, I think I can do to, just to make it to make it clearer. I will import this one. I will explain it. Let me see first if I didn't break anything. Okay, good. Everything's still working as expected, but this will make it clear. So what I am doing in this component, I am first showing the nav bar. The nav bar is what you see here. This is the navigation bar. Then. I will be loading one of these components. One of these lucky components will be loaded, one of them. That's why I'm putting here switch. How, which one will be loaded? How do we decide which one to load? No, based on the URL we have in the browser. You see here? Of course, when I click, the, the URL changes. So based on the URL, if the user comes to slash, which component will load? The home. If the user comes to slash about, which component to load? About. When the user comes to slash topics, yeah, and so on. So that's what this uh, uh, switch is doing. It's saying, go ahead and load this component when the user visits this path. Go ahead, otherwise, if the user visits this path, which component should I load? Okay. About. Now, when, this, when the user comes to this slash topic, slash topic ID, you see this column in front of slash topic ID? What does that mean? This is a parameter. Regardless of what you put here, it doesn't matter what you put here, I will always be loading this topic. 
yeah you see here um, this is for example topic slash I'll be loading whatever whatever topic you asked me. So what I mean by this, the the last part of the URL is a really parameter. The last part of the URL is a really parameter. Um, so basically, that's the idea of the router. The router allows you to decide dynamically decide which component to load based on the path the user has visited. So it's a very powerful declarative way. It will magically do it for you. All you need to do is to tell what you want, what you want to happen. How to, how to tell a React router what you want to happen? By configuring, by configuring the route, telling the router, okay, if the user comes to this path, load this. If the user comes to that path, load that, and so on. Yeah. So sometimes, if even if you don't have a component, you can you can kind of return some results on the fly. So you can either have a you associate a path with the component. That's one way of doing it. Or you can say, when the user comes to this path, what should I do? I want you to render this. I want you to return this to the user. In this case, I'm returning this H1. I don't have a component yet, or I just want to kind of build this component on the fly. Yeah? Uh, okay. So one thing I want to show you, here, here are the components. This is the, by the way, this is the home component. This is the about component. These are different components. Yeah? This is the topic component and so on. Now, couple of more concepts I want to show you here to, to explain some more features. Before I show you more features, I want to show you how this navbar is built, how the navbar is built. So the navbar itself is a component. Can you see it? Remember, React is all about breaking the page into multiple components. So the navbar is a component, and here is the definition of it. So the nav bar is a component, which is a function that returns this uh, nav bar, which is uh, made up of an unordered list. And then all I am doing, the only difference here is that instead of using an anchor tag like this, I create the links using this link class, this link component. So what I do here, take a look, I import the link, the link component from React Router DOM, and then create a link for each of my components. And say in here, create a link for the slash, create a link for slash about, create a link for uh, topics and so on. Okay, so this is how, so when, I, when I'm using a React router, I should not create the links using an A tag. Instead, I should create the links using the link uh, component. The link component coming with the reactor out. Yep. Okay. By the way, if I, this is my about two. Take a look at this. If I create my links using my own, the old way of doing it, the problem is, take a look. The problem is, this is about two. When I click this, the whole page refresh. I don't want to, to do the whole page refresh. That's why I don't create links using an A tag, how do I create links with a React router? Link. Using the link component. Yeah? Uh, few more concepts and I will let you go. Um, of course, you will practice this for you to, to, to solidify your understanding. Okay, now, uh, what I have here, you see the, the React router. When the React router loads a particular component, into the page, it passes to it three properties. I'll show you shortly. Here it is. Take a look. Uh, inspect, and I go to scope. So when I visit the home, take a look at the console, what will happen? Here's the home. So React Router sent to my components three objects automatically. The React Router gives my component three objects. What are these three objects? History, History, location, and match. 
Each one has its own purpose. So history, I use history if I want to programmatically send the, the user to a different page. Programmatically send the user to a different page. I use the location if I just want to know where I am in the page. For example, here I am in the slash. The path name is slash. And here the match is the most important one that we use very frequently. The match object gives me the parameters. If there are any parameters passed with the request, they will come there. In here, there is no parameters passed. But if I visit this one, take a look. I have a parameters there. Now, let me, sorry, let me clear this. Here it, here it is. I have a match. There is the parameter. See here, the parameter is the topic ID is prop versus state. Yeah? If I visit this one, what will be the parameter name? Let me clear. The parameter ID is, um, here it is, Comp uh, topic ID is components. How does the React know, know this, that the last part of the URL, the last part of the URL, how does the React know that the last part of the URL is a really parameter? Because we told it so. You see here, when I, cre when I configured the router, I told the router that when it comes to slash topics, the last, th the last thing that comes after slash topic is a parameter. So uh, when you visit that link, make these parameters available to the component that you load. And React does exactly that. Yeah? So take a look. In the, uh, so in here, in the topic component, I have two parameters coming, history and match. Who, create, who provided this parameter to this component? React. The React router. Thank you very much. What do we use the history object for? If I want to programmatically, can you see here? You, can you see here, when I click this link, when I click this link back, I programmatically take the user back to the home page. Programmatically. What I mean here, you have seen in many cases, you might have a task, let's say you have a task list or a jobs list. You might allow the user to add a new job. When they submit, you save the job and you redirect the user back to the list of jobs. This is very common, redirecting a user to another, to another page. You can do so programmatically. All you do, you take the history object and you call the method push. What this method will do, will redirect the user wherever you want the user to go, to go back to. I can redirect them to slash about. See here, when I am, when I am done, when I go here and redirect, I go to about. Yeah? Here, redirect, I go to about. So this allows me as a progr to programmatically send the user to any route in my app. Now, how do I know uh, what was the parameter that was passed to this component? By going to match.params. the name of the parameter. Similar to what you have been doing on the server side with the uh, with server side with the uh, web API. Remember, in on the server side, when a request come, you can read the parameters by going to request request uh, rec.params. Kind of similar here. Instead, in here, how do you read the parameters coming to the component? By going to match whatever the name of the parameter might happens to be. Now, what is this match? It's an object passed to passed to the component by by React route. Yeah. So. Maybe it's, a, of course, there's a lot of concepts going on here, a lot of things going on here, but let me just summarize. Um, of course, you will start from basic features and you, then you go to more advanced features. What is really needed, this is the minimum you need to understand, is that a router allows you to configure alternative routes, alternative routes, by, say, by allowing you to say to the router, when the user comes to this path, this is the component you should load. When the, when the user comes to the other path, this is the component you should load. That is the basic functionality of the router. 
The other functionality it gives you, you can programmatically uh, route to you or kind of redirect the user to different route by using history.push. And you can also programmatically read any parameters coming to the component by using match.params. Yeah. Those are the basic, uh, the basic ingredients of um, React Route. Is this kind of clear? The, ba the basic idea of it? Yeah. I know it's a lot of things going on, but you have like this week and you have, inshallah, next week to really master this through uh, the labs. And of course, you will practice this more in your, on your project. Yeah. Okay, um, as if there isn't enough stuff to cover, there's one more concept, one more, and that's it. Um, in case you need it, you don't need to worry too much about it, but just in case you need it, um, I want to show it to you. Remember, if, if I have some piece of data that, that, the par that I need to pass to a child component, I can pass them up as props. You remember this, yes? So the parent component can, can pass data to the child component through props. This is not a strange statement, yes? Okay, now, the problem is sometimes you have a child and grandchild and grand-grandchild, you have a, a deep hierarchy of components, yeah? So if you have some piece of data in the in the grandparent, you have to pass it to the child, and the child has to pass it to the grandchild, and the grandchild has to pass it to the grand-grandchild. You can do this, there's no problem. But wouldn't it be nicer, wouldn't it be nicer if we have something global, accessible anywhere? Um, what I mean by this, wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of global bucket where I can put some global objects and functions that can be accessed from anywhere. Yeah? So, any, uh, like some components can put some provider or some component can put some uh, objects and, and functions here and some consumers can come and get uh, basically get these get these objects. Yeah. So React has this ability has the ability to do this. And this bucket where you can store kind of some share some globally accessible uh, variables and function. This this uh, this container this global container visible to anyone to any component. In React, we call it a context. Sorry. Con yes, context. Yeah, I spell it right. Context. Whenever you hear this context, it might be very something kind of confusing. But at the end of the day, it's nothing but this global, global container. Okay? So some components will write to it, and some will read from it. Conceptually is, is clear? Okay. So programmatically, let me show you. You might not need to worry too much about it at this stage, but just be aware of it. Uh, later on, you might, you, might, you might find it useful. Um, if it's not too overwhelming at this stage, of course, this is a little bit more advanced, but this is the last one. Uh, just for you to be aware of it. You might not necessarily use it now. You might use it later on. So what you, uh, let me show you the example. And the realistic example could be, the realistic example could be when you log in. Remember, when you log into a system, what, what the system return you back? For example, in your login method in your project, if you remember, the login, it takes as input what? The username and password. What does it return? No, no, the login method on the server. So the login, it takes in the, e the email and the password and returns the user object. Thank you. What the user object will have? First name, last name, maybe the, the, 
the user ID, and so on. So these user objects might be interesting to any component. Many components will make use of it. Yeah. So when you log in, the system will, will get back a user. And the system will hold that user object and make it available to any component. Remember, when you log in in some systems, on the right side, usually they will tell you welcome and they put your name. How they knew your name? From the user objects came after the login. Yeah? Uh, and so on. So, for example, in your use case, remember the uh, get jobs when you log in as a customer in your project? What that use case is supposed to do? Get the jobs for that particular customer that is currently logged in. You follow it? So the get job, for the get job component to do its work, what it needs? The, the, the user ID or the customer ID. From where do we get this customer ID? User. From the user object that was returned when the, when, the, uh, when the user logs in. So the user object makes a very, very good candidate for one of the objects to be in this global bucket. So when I log in, I get a user object. What do I do with this user object? Put it in this global bucket. One of them will be a user object. Whoever needs it can grab the user object and extract information from it. For example, the, uh, the, the, uh, the navigation bar. Remember, the navigation bar is a component. It might, use, it might need the user object to get the name, and, uh, the first name and last name and welcome the user and uh, display a message saying, welcome, Fulano, or Fulano. Yes, you get the idea. So when we log in, user object is created, we place it in this global, uh, global container, and then it's available to any component to, to, to make use of. That's, one, that's very realistic use case of using this global, uh, globally available uh, container. Yeah. So this is the concept. Practically, how it is done. Um, practically, the way it is done, what you do is you go ahead and, and ask React, please go ahead and create for me a context. What, what does it mean, creating a context? Thank you very much. It's making this empty global content. And this empty, I, I call this user context because I'll be placing in it the user object that I get after the login. Yeah. Now, once I create this, I go to my root component. What is the root component in this case? The app. Thank you. And what I do, I, I import this user context. I import this global bucket that I created. And what I do here, I go and say user context that provider, saying that I am accessing the user context as a provider. And what I'm doing here, I am placing in this container. You remember, the context is nothing but a container. I am placing two things. I am placing a user object, and I am placing this function, hello. You can place in there whatever you wish. But in this case, I am placing a user, and I am placing this function. Can you see here? User, it's hard-coded here. Username, first name, last name. Yeah. And I'm also placing, hello, I might have a function everybody is interested in making use of. I'm also making it, putting it in the context. Um, so how do I place things in a context in this global container? By doing this contain, uh, user context dot provider, please take this user, place it in this context, please take this hello and place it in the context. Yeah. So the, remember, the context, as I explained, has two parts. There's the provider part. The provider part is the one that puts those elements in the, con in the container. And we have the consumer part. Who, what the consumer does, they go to this global state, and they glo this global container, and what they do? They read from it some objects or some functions. So here is the, pro that's it, this is the provider part. In the provider part, all we do, we say here, user context, this is the user context coming from here, and say user context dot provider, value equal, which means go ahead and place in the container these two things. 
the user object and the hello and the hello function. That's what I'm asking the container to do. Now, all, all the components that happen to be inside this can access can now access this component, uh, can access whatever we put in the context. So we have to put the children object inside this, and all these objects, regardless of the, where they are, whether they are children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, they all can access what I, whatever I have already placed in, in this global context. So how do I access it? Let, let me show you from welcome. Again, what I do, I import the user context, and, I, and then I'll say, and I'll say to React, please go to this user context called user con. Go to this uh, context and extract for me these two things, a user and a hello. And basically, I will get the, the user that available in that context, and I will get the hello that's available in that context. Let me show you, and then let me go. So if I go to, uh, here it is. Go to React app. Let me uh, inspect this, close. Let me, yeah, let me refresh. So here is the user context, basically what's going on. So from the welcome, see from this welcome component, I am able to get I'm able to get access to the, to the uh, user object. I am also able to call the hello function provided by the place in the user context. What I want to say here, let me show you, just to prove this. Um, so in here I'll be saying um, from welcome component. So this information is coming from welcome component, and I will also put it in here. Hello from welcome component. Okay, so just to, so you can see here, this is from welcome components. I am able to access this user object. And also this hello Ali is coming from this, from this, uh, from the welcome components, I am able to go to this global con global context, which is this global container. I am able to go there and extract the user object and extract the hello function. I was able to access the properties of the user object and able to call the hello function. It's a little bit, um, it needs a little bit of getting used to, um, but. For now, just be aware of it. Uh, I understand there are a lot of things to, uh, to grasp in one go. But just to summarize, I, and I will let you go, that's it. In, in React, there is something called context. And what it allows you to do, it allows any component, uh, provider component, typically the root component, to place some objects or some functions in this component, in this context, and then other 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 consumer components, other consumer components, they could be not necessarily child, it could be grandchild, grand grandchild, any component in the tree, they can go to this context and enjoy themselves and use whatever comp whatever objects and functions that were placed in this global context. Yeah? How to do it mechanically? I showed you the steps, also the slides, they are there. And of course, the only way to really grasp it is you have to really do it yourself. Okay? So I hope uh, this gives you the base. Uh, please go through this. You need to go really go through the slides, go through the examples I provided, and you will go through step by step in the lab and you will practice this gradually until hopefully you get a good grasp of it. Okay, thank you very much.